hello everyone welcome um you know with all the turmoil and everything that's going on the last few weeks things have been crazy and and trying to process everything digest everything i thought that this would be a great opportunity for me to shed some light on some of my past experiences with the police growing up as a kid miami florida you know i haven't had it easy all the time and i know that a lot of people um, may um, assume certain things about me or um, make presumptions about uh, maybe kind of you know what my experiences were uh, but I did want to come on today and talk about uh, my uh, personal experiences and some of the sentiments that I felt you know I too am afraid of the police uh, something that uh, has been with me for a very long time and is really difficult to share because you know these are things that are deep rooted from within a lot of the stuff that happens to us as kids we carry with us into our adulthood and into the experiences in that life and so I remember uh, very vividly a time when uh, I was with my friends and we were driving uh, and it's we're talking about maybe 15 minutes from where I grew up uh, we were in but the when you cross over the area the, the line okay the area becomes predominantly a white neighborhood and I remember driving uh, in that area and hearing police sirens, right? And uh, we were leaving uh, from trying to find a party. We weren't not able successfully to find that party. So we're leaving, we're actually exiting the community. Um, the area's called Lakes by the Bay. A lot of people who are in Miami may know that area very well, Lakes by the Bay. And so we were leaving Lakes by the Bay. And uh, as we're leaving, you know, we heard all these police sirens, we heard all the noise and everything like that. And um, and then we realized really quickly once we were surrounded by the police, but that they were coming for us. And so the police um, surrounded our cars. They blocked us from being able to drive. Um, and they told us to get out of the car. Uh, it was like four of my friends and I. And I was actually driving my mom's car because back then I didn't have a car, so I would drive my mom's car. And uh, they immediately start questioning us and asking us where we came from what we were doing in that area and um, you know we weren't speeding we didn't have any broken lights uh, we didn't run a light like we didn't um, they pulled us over and said that uh, we matched a suspect we matched a description of a suspect the car matched the description of a car that was given to us for someone that had um, or some people that had committed some robberies in the areas and so that's why they pulled us over and then which was really crazy to me was that they asked um, did we have any weapons in the car? And, they, and I remember because they were like, do you have any like AK-47s, any uh, grenade launchers and things like that? And I thought, how like how ridiculous was that? And I and I had never heard that before. And, he, and I go, and the guy's like, yeah, do you have any grenade launchers and, and AK-47s and uh, 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 Uzis? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, who has a grenade launcher? Um, and then, you know, they went on, asked me um, if we had any criminal past and things like that. And, you know, it was just, it was mind blogging because we were just driving normal speed, right? Um, and it wasn't no crazy hours or anything like that. I mean, it was after, it was obviously, it was dark time, but it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't three in the morning or anything. It just, we were leaving, I think it was maybe 10 o'clock at night, nine, 10 o'clock at night. And, um, you know, they asked me, uh, said, well, you know, do you have any nicknames? And jokingly, I said, yeah, my, my girlfriend calls me Bay. But again, it was almost comical, the questions that they asked us. But at that, that sticks in my mind of being surrounded by multiple police cars. And then another incident that I can vividly remember was uh, there was a Taco Bell in Miami near 152nd Street. And uh, we were pulling in a Taco Bell to get something to eat. And we were surrounded by police cars again. Um, but this time, the police cars that surrounded us, uh, when they stopped us and blocked us in from like trying to drive, go into the drive through from every angle, like, I mean, there was a car pointed at us in every single direction. Um, and so then uh, that particular incident is, they actually drew guns on us. And it was, it was, um, 
you know, it was crazy because as a teenager and you're sitting in a car and you're having police draw guns on you and pointing guns towards your car from every direction, um, we were always taught to, you know, when I'm getting pulled over, you put your hands on the steering wheel or you put your hands out the window. And then a step further, my uncle would tell us to actually take the keys out the ignition and throw the keys on top of the roof, on top of the ceiling of the car. So I was accustomed to showing, you know, taking the keys out when I'm pulled over, taking the keys out of the like ignition, turn it off, pull it out, and throw it on top of the roof to show that I'm not trying to flee. I'm not gonna, uh, I can't start the car anymore because I no longer have the keys. And then putting my hands immediately on the steering wheel so that they can clearly see them. In this particular case, I was with my nephew. Freddie at the time, and he um, he was very upset and frustrated that as why they were pulling you know guns out on us and why did they uh, stop us in this manner? And he was you know like we said getting flip and saying you know forget this and he was upset. And I said, listen, please, you know just put your hands on the dashboard like they're asking us to. Um, and he was in the passenger seat. I was the driver. And he was like, look, I said, listen, if I don't care about the, for the police, do it for me. Just put your hands on the dashboard. We don't want them to shoot us. And, you know, that was our norm. Uh, and I was a great student, never had did drugs, didn't drink. We always had our license, always had registration. So I actually never went to jail behind any of these incidents. But it was just a constant, you know, being harassed. And it was like every other weekend that I went out, we knew that we we're going to be stopped by the police. Every other weekend, like it was, you mean, you, you could count it. If we went out three weekends, we got stopped twice. Um, it was like almost every 10 days. And that was our norm. Our norm was you're going to go out and you're going to be stopped by the police. Okay. So actually, the interesting is that's, again, we, you know, I made sure to tell everyone, everyone had to be clean to come to my car. And that was like the standard for us, right? Um, fortunately, like I said, nothing bad ever happened. But it just left a really um, like sour, you know, spot in your heart uh, with regard to how you felt about police and how they treated you. And we always heard about jump out boys. Um, you know, we knew about that down in Miami. And you know, it, it just it just made it very uh, difficult to see them in a in a positive light. Um, they were all, we were always taught that obviously you know the police were your friend growing up, but then when you get become a teenager, and you experience you know different things, uh, it makes it hard for you to to balance that. Another incident that stood out in my mind uh, that baffled me as a teenager was, um, you know we we're coming back from a party and we're driving through downtown Miami and not driving actually through it but driving around it on um, Biscayne Boulevard. And uh, we saw someone committing a robbery. Uh, we flagged down a police officer, stopped the police officer, and said, hey, we just witnessed a robbery from this store. Um, and then they proceeded to arrest us and put us in a car and, and, and told us that they bet that we had something to do with it. And it was, it was just, it just, again, it puzzled my mind because I'm like, here I am trying to help and assist in what I saw was someone committing a crime. And instead, they accused me of being the one to have something to do with it. Uh, they took our fingerprints, they took our pictures, and they told us they didn't want to see us in this area. And then, and then the police officer, I remember him saying, I bet you a million dollars that you guys had something to do with it. And that's the same thing that happened in the Taco Bell case, was that the police officer, you know, they said that we had guns and that we were, someone had called and said that we were shooting at, that we were allegedly, I guess, pulling our gun at on people on the highway and that's why they stopped us. And that they, they bet that we had guns in the car and weapons. And I, I never had any weapons. I, in fact, I still don't have any weapons today. You know, at 41 years old, I still don't own an actual gun. I've never owned a gun. I've never carried guns. Um, I've actually been afraid of guns. So it's just, it, it puzzled me that they could say, like, allege that I, I got guns and weapons and things like that. And so that incident in downtown, uh, you know, we got put in a police car. We got picture, fingerprint. And again... You know, we got our registration, we have our insurance, we have all our paperwork, so nothing happened from that. I remember going back home that evening and calling the NAACP. And I told, you know, it's not the same day, but the following day, and I told my parents about it. We called the NAACP, and their reaction was more like, hey, you shouldn't have been out at that time of night in those areas and things like that. And I get it, because we are taught 
that you can't say anything to the police, whether you're right or not. You just know you are not allowed to um, say anything because of what they may do to you. And, and, you know, that's a horrible way to grow up is where you can't even, like, uh, say, you know, you can't, even if you're in the right, you have to just go along and play along with whatever happens to you. So, I, you know, fast forward to my college years. And, um, you know, it's, it's like I remember my friends always saying that, you know, you think because you speak properly and you talk educated, and that you hang out with, you know, white people that you think that, like, you're like them, right? And that they're going to remind you, right, every once in a while that you're not them. And, uh, you know, I, again, I've had all types of friends growing up. I wasn't gifted. I was in AP classes. So, again, I have a diverse group of friends. But, you know, when I was in college, my friends said, look, you know, they're going to always put you back in your place and remind you. And it's very true that no matter what I did, no matter what I said, no matter my accomplishments, I founded the Entrepreneurs Club, I raised money for a business, I was always reminded, right, that I was lesser, that I was inferior, that I had to work harder and be better and prove myself more. And uh, time and time again, those things would happen to me. And I remember being in an entrepreneurship, uh, you know, business plan competition at the University of Florida. And, uh, you know, we were the, the best business plan written and everyone stated that and and all the judges said hey you've got the best plan um you've got the best uh, idea uh you've proven your concept and so we were raved in the reviews when comparing us to all the other uh, opponents against us in the particular competition but yet we won second place and uh so even it was just weird to me you know how they could say such such positively about our company but yet give us second place and, you know, it's just, again, I, these things that stand out in my mind that say, okay, again, Eric, you've got to work harder. You've got to be better. Um, you know, you've got to do twice as much. You've got to be three times as good. Um, and so, you know, that stuck with me. And, and you know, I think that that, that is uh, part of, you know, what makes uh, our experiences different from the experiences of the privileged people out there. I think that that's what makes us, um, you know, unique is the fact that we, uh, we do grew up with these different set of rules and by which we have to operate in and play by. And, um, you know, I think that that needs to be told and shared with people because, uh, we, you know, we always walk around and we feel, regardless of what we've accomplished or achieved, that we're still not going to match up and we're still not going to be equal. You know, fast forward to even in recent times, you know, even in recent times, uh, we've had incidences where, again, um, I've been in, in situations where I've encountered the police and, um, you know, if you're with your white friends and the police stopped us, um, they just said, hey, you know, have a great day, see you on your way. Um, and then with you put your black friends and a police stop you, it's a whole nother experience. And, and so again, you know, we go from teenager to young adult to uh, experienced man to even uh, in recent times. And then we'll take it even a step further and we'll look at even my journey into starting my business, Evan Koff. You know, on my business card, I never had the word president or CEO, anything like that. I was always a project manager or program manager for my business. And I would intentionally not tell people I was the business owner for fear that they would ridicule me, for fear that they may damage my projects, for fear that they would do something to sabotage my job sites and my construction sites. And, you know, I think that that is, is terrible. I think it's, it's, it's horrible. It's horrific that we have to pretend to not be, um, you know, proud of, of, of having built a business, of having uh, hired people and employed people, and we have to hide and, and be almost like ashamed um, so that people would not uh, cause us harm or try to cause harm or impact my business in that way. 
And, you know, this morning, my son asked me, even because a lot of these stories I'm sharing today, I didn't even share with him. And he asked me, he goes, Dad, you know, you never told me about any, uh, any of the things that happened to you. He goes, what happened to you? And so I started telling him some of these experiences. And it's, it's just my normal, right? This is the normal of people like myself. We have a very different normal than other people out there. And my normal was, yeah, I, again, I get on here and I tell you guys, yeah, this is, it was my business. Obviously, it was my business. I was the only owner. I put all my money into it, everything I did. But when I went to certain projects and certain jobs, I knew that people always question, right, if it was a, a young owner, a black owner. And so for fear that uh, something negative may happen because, again, there's a lot of jealousy out there. A lot of people did not want to see me succeed. And I, see, I saw that in, in, in their performance and their work and what they did once they found out that was a black owner, that I started saying that I was just the project manager. And that gave people a lot more comfort and knowing that I was an equal to them. And I remember being on a project site with other people who thought I was just a project manager. And they shared with me all types of information about their company and how they were going to and do this job and everything like that. Stuff that they wouldn't have said if I had told them that I was the, the president of the company or was the founder of the company. So just saying that I was a project manager eased any race relations or tensions that they may have against me because I wasn't better than them or I wasn't higher than them. And it, I actually used to brag about that to people out here because I thought it was was cool, right, um, and, and expressing, like getting, like getting over because uh, I was able to defeat or diffuse any type of race issues. But it's actually sad. It's, it's sad that you have to pretend to be something worse, right, or not even worse, something uh, less than what you are and, and, and belittle your accomplishments, belittle your achievements so that other people can feel superior or feel um, that, they, that they are on the same level. Um, and, and so, you know, when you look at that and you reflect on those things, you say to yourself, um, right, that, that is, this is, this is America. And that is the real America. And this is, that, you know, these things we're talking about with the businesses, and that's 2018. That's 2019. Um, this isn't 100 years ago. This isn't 50 years ago. You know, th this stuff is stuff that's happened to me. And I, and I thought I should share that because, again, if I don't share my stories and what happened to me, people may go around believing that their own reality of whatever the narrative that is that they want to paint about me or who I am of what I've been through. So I wanted to put out there the actual experiences that I had so that people could know that. Um, when Ahmaud Arbery was shot, I was afraid. You know, I really was afraid because I remember like the, the next week or the same week, I was walking at like seven in the morning down a sidewalk on a back road and there was a white guy approaching from the distance and I was afraid because no one was out there. There was no camera to capture experience. And I really had an anxiety inside of me about what could have happened to me um, had this guy pulled out a gun and what would be the story that would be told. And then it will be his version versus, well, it wouldn't be my version because I wouldn't be here. So it would be his version versus what? Versus whatever, um, if, if no one captured that moment, then it would just be his version of the story. And then what could happen. And that really created uh, a fear within me that, again, I didn't try to, 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 to have aroused. I didn't, um, I didn't plant that. Um, it's, it's something that happened that was subconscious and that anxiety exists today. Um, and it still exists. And the more times that I think this, this stuff continues to happen, the more it makes people uneasy and I know that makes me uneasy and that's part of the reason why you know I have to tune out from the news and tune out from all this stuff because it is a big deal um, and it does impact um, our psyche our mental psyche I know it impacts my mental psyche and um, you know you add what's happening today you couple that with what the experiences happened to you in the past and you know how easily that that could have been you and I know people say it but I'm here to say how I personally feel without 
a crowd, without an audience to share because I want people to know, right? And I want people to know my particular experiences. And then that way they don't have to guess or assume or make any presumptions about Eric and who Eric is and um, you know what Eric's story was. So now you've heard it from me and you can take it for whatever you want, um, see it however you like to see it. But, but again, I have never traveled in your shoes. You've never traveled in my shoes. Um, and I know that, like even talking to my son, if someone has never experienced it, and you know, it's hard to explain. It's hard to believe. I mean, it's hard for me to believe, and I was the person in it, right? It's hard for me to believe that that people would do that. But it, but it happened, right? And I experienced it. So you know, I just want to share that with people out there, given the situation, given everything that's happening. Um, you know, I didn't let it defeat me. I haven't let it stop me. Obviously, I'm persisting. I'm doing um, all these things that you guys see. I'm creating content out there, but. Um, you know, it does concern me and I have been subjected to a lot of the same things that they're showing on the news and on TV as well. In fact, it made me uh, reluctant to go out and protest in the beginning because of fear of what could have happened to me, like the 75-year-old guy that was pushed over, like the people that were pepper sprayed and tear grass. It made me actually f afraid to go out there because I've already been in those types of situations before. Um, and dark places and um, secluded places where if something would have happened to me, there was no, this was the pre-body camera days, pre-cell phone days. I mean, we had cell phones, but they didn't have cameras and stuff on them. Then it wouldn't have been, you know, these same police officers would have got off as well um, in the case of the Eric Coffey shooting. Thanks so much for listening. Um, just want to share those experiences out there with them. I hope, um, you know, you guys get a, a deeper perspective of kind of where I come from and some of my experiences, um, whatever it does for you, um, I, I, I can't say, but I did want to 